Good afternoon. Happy uh, noon time to everybody. My name is Austin Fall. I'm with the Division of Hospital Medicine. Uh, it is my pleasure and uh, honor, frankly, this morning I, I learned I get to introduce our speakers today for the Roy H. Bankey Grain Rounds. Um, that is uh, entitled The Importance of Civic Health. Uh, you have the, uh, the uh, pleasure to hear from two colleagues and friends of mine that I've uh, not only trained with, but uh, been in practice with for quite a few years now. Um, Dr. Austin out of Miami and Dr. Uh, uh, Caputo Seidler out of uh, SUNY Upstate New York. Um, you know, I, I have a lot to say about these individuals, but certainly what you're going to hear about today is something that I'm, I know they both are particularly proud of. Um, this is beyond their excellent clinical care, but their prominence in the community, not just our local community, but beyond the university's community is something that uh, I aspire to. I think that they find more hours in the day than 24 um, and certainly the ability to uh, teach me a lot of things that I still need to learn more about. So I've been looking forward to today's talk uh, and certainly am uh, honored to have the opportunity to introduce uh, both these individuals. So without further ado, uh, please, Dr. Austin and Dr. Caputo Seidler, thank you very much for taking the time today for us. Thank you for that introduction, Austin. I'm just gonna get the slides back up here. Can you all see that? See it fine, go ahead. Okay. Um, so here are the learning objectives that we will cover today. Um, we are going to discuss the benefits that voting has on health. We're going to talk about the role that we as healthcare providers and that healthcare institutions can have on registering patients to vote. And then we're going to discuss the impact of the Vote ER program, which is a nonpartisan organization that aids healthcare institutions in getting patients registered to vote and provides some tools to help do that. Um, and it's also a program that, uh, with the support of Dr. Sennett and Dr. Oxner, um, Dr. Austin and I have had the opportunity to do a civic health fellowship with them that we are just wrapping up this month. So living in Florida, right, we know how important our votes are come presidential elections. We are one of the states that has the ability to swing an election in one direction or the other. But the 2020 election is far in the rear view mirror though the news media might not want to let us believe that. And the 2024 election is still a bit off in the future. So you may be asking yourselves, why are we here today in January 2022 to talk to you about voting? And our hope is that by the end of the hour, you will agree with us that voting and engagement in the voting process matters every day, not just come big elections. And there's three reasons why this is the case. One, civic engagement promotes health. Two, racial and social inequities persist and require non-optical solutions. And we hope to convince you that voting is one of those solutions. And three, healthcare providers need to vote. And historically, we have been very bad at doing so. So how does civic engagement promote health? Right, we all know by now that the work that we do in the exam room with our patients really accounts for only a portion of their ultimate health outcomes. But social factors have an even greater impact on the ultimate health of that patient. Things like, do they have stable housing? Do they have transportation? What's their income? What educational opportunities do they have? Do they have access to healthy food and clean water? All of these things are of great importance when it comes to a person's ultimate health. And we know this. And so when we think about kind of the scale on which we can act on somebody's social needs and how they affect their health. We can start with the very small, their health-related social needs. These are really the effects of all of those things I just mentioned. And these are the things that we're typically intervening on in our physician-patient relationship. 
Then we can zoom out a little bit and think of those social determinants of health. Those are the things that are occurring on a community-wide scale or a regional scale. And then we could zoom out even further and we could consider what are the structural determinants of health that are affecting our patient. And these are even further upstream causes of health outcomes. These are things that are occurring on a national, societal, political level that trickle down and impact the health of the patient that we're trying to take care of. So when we think about how we can impact these determinants on the different levels, right? The work that we do every day is really at that micro level. It's addressing those health-related social needs. This is when we decide to prescribe one medication over another because of what the copay will be for the patient. Or when we modify our dietary recommendations for a patient who lives in a food desert. Or when we involve our colleagues in social work to figure out a transportation plan for a patient so that they can continue to come to their medical appointments. But all of those things that we're doing are really working on the effects of those upstream causes. What voting has the power to do is to impact those structural and social determinants of health and address those upstream causes. Because the people that we put into elected office have the power to enact policies and to allocate resources that affect those determinants. And we have a very unique position as healthcare providers to really affect the most vulnerable of society. Right? The same people that are marginalized by our healthcare system, the people who we take care of at Tampa General and at 30th Street and at Bridge Clinic and through Tampa Bay Street Medicine, are also the same people who are likely to be left out of the current voting process because they are eligible, but they're not registered to vote. And when we consider the overlap of those two groups, the three main demographics that come out are the young, the poor, and people of color. And what happens when these groups don't vote is that campaigns don't engage with them because they don't feel like they are likely to become voters, right? Your voting record is a public record. And the best predictor of you showing up at the polls is if you have voted in recent elections. So if you're not registered to vote, or if you are registered, but you haven't voted in recent elections, then campaigns label you as an unlikely voter. And they don't want to expend resources, time, money, energy, trying to make outreach to people who they don't think are likely to show up at the polls. So they don't listen to those voices from the community, to what the needs are amongst those people who are unlikely to vote. So they don't develop platforms that address those structures that are in place that may be negatively impacting the health of those communities. And it creates this vicious cycle. And it's a complex relationship. It's not as simple as voting determines your health outcome. But because we know that who we put into office has the ability to affect many of those social determinants of health, Right, who we are going to elect here in Tampa is certainly going to impact housing and the skyrocketing rent prices, um, is going to impact transportation. Right, we know we could be doing a lot more to support people in our city who rely on public transportation. Those things have an impact on the health of communities here. So, here are some examples from the real world of how all of these factors overlap. If we look at East Harlem, this is a predominantly black and Hispanic neighborhood in New York. Poverty rate that's 13% higher than the 
also a neighborhood that has low voter turnout. The voter turnout was 35% lower in East Harlem than for the rest of New York City during the 2018 mayor election. East Harlem also has a significantly lower life expectancy than the remainder of New York. Somebody born in East Harlem can expect to live to the age of 66. If you compare that to me, I was born 50 miles north of East Harlem in Mayapack, New York. That gives me an average life expectancy of 80. It's a 14 year difference and just 50 miles apart. We can see a similar pattern in Southwest Detroit. This is a very industrial area. There's over 24 individual industrial sites here, steel plants, auto plants, oil refineries, and residents of Southwest Detroit can expect to live seven years less than the average American. They're also hospitalized for asthma at a rate five times that of the average American and twice the rate of the rest of the state of Michigan. Southwest Detroit is also an area of low voter turnout. 41% of the lowest voter turnout districts in the state are in the city of Detroit, and a good number of those are congregated in Southwest Detroit. So you can imagine that when it comes time for the city council to make decisions about whether to allow that 25th industrial site to open up in this area, the residents who are being hospitalized for asthma and having their life expectancy shortened, their voices are not heard in that conversation because they're not turning out to vote and put people into those local positions. If we move a little bit closer to home, um, Woodland Acres is one of the neighborhoods in Jacksonville. Again, this is a neighborhood of low voter turnout. They were 18% um, lower than the average for the city of Jacksonville during their 2015 mayor race. And it's also an area that has a lower life expectancy as compared to the entire state of Florida. So you can see the same pattern time and time again in every region across the country. You have this overlap between neighborhoods that are predominantly residents of color, often areas of low income, areas where there's low voter turnout, and then those same areas experience these adverse health effects. We see some of that same pattern right here in Hillsborough County. If you look at District 3, which is highlighted in green on the map, again, this is a, um, a district that has a large Black and Hispanic population. It is 39% Black and 29% Hispanic. District 3 also contains our zip codes that have the lowest median income um, with incomes uh, less than $35,000 per household. And District 3 had a significantly lower voter turnout in the 2020 election compared with the rest of Hillsborough County. So you can ask yourself, what do you think is the comparison for your patient's health who live in 33604 compared to your patient's health who reside in South Tampa? But it's not all doom and gloom um, because we can reverse this cycle. Um, as healthcare providers, as that trusted person in the physician patient relationship, if we encourage patients to register to vote and to actually show up on election day, and we turn those patients into voters, then they will become labeled as likely voters and campaigns will pay attention because they're gonna want those votes come election day. So they will listen to the needs of those communities 
and they will run on platforms that are going to address those needs. And now we've created a new cycle that's a positive feedback loop. And who do we have the most power to impact? People from lower income brackets have the most increase in voter turnout when they're encouraged to vote by their healthcare institutions when you compare it to people from higher income brackets. People of color have a greater increase in voter turnout when they're encouraged to vote by their healthcare providers as compared to white patients. And young people have a greater increase in voter turnout when they're encouraged to vote by their healthcare providers as compared to older patients. And even for individuals who are already registered, but who don't show up at the polls, those people who are labeled as unlikely voters or low propensity voters, in the 2020 election, when those people were reminded by a healthcare provider to vote, they showed up at a rate 20% higher than they had in previous elections. So those individuals who are most disenfranchised by our current voting system, the young, the poor, and people of color, are the same demographics that we have the greatest ability to influence as healthcare providers in encouraging them to register to vote and to show up on election day. And again, this ties back to influencing those social and structural determinants of health. Because who votes right, determines who holds elected office. And those individuals are the ones who create the policies and allocate the resources that can influence those social determinants of health. And if it's only a small percentage of people who are showing up at the polls, then the actions of the government are going to be skewed to only meet the needs of those few who historically have been older, wealthier, and whiter than the communities that they come from. But if we can empower larger groups of people to register, then we can have a system where our elected officials are allocating resources in a more equitable way that will address those social and structural determinants of health that are impacting the work that we do every day with our patients. And I will turn it over to Dr. Austin. Thank you, Dr. Caputo. Um, so we just discussed the indirect benefits of voting on health. So let's move on to the direct benefits. So there have actually been many studies done on voting and their impacts on health. So the one listed here, um, one of the authors is actually a classmate of mine uh, during my master's in public health in London. Um, he's based out of Toronto. And this review um, found over 2,000 citations of which 40 articles met their inclusion criteria. Selected articles dated from 1991 to 2018 and were conducted primarily in Europe the USA and Canada. They identified four interrelated areas explored in the literature. One, that there is consistency in the association between voting and health. Two, that differences in voter participation are associated with health conditions. Three, that the gaps in voter participation may be associated with electoral outcomes. And four, interventions in healthcare organizations can increase voter participation. They concluded that voting and health are associated, namely with wor people with worse health tend to be less likely to engage in voting. Differences in voter participation due to social, economic, and health inequities have been shown to have large effects on electoral outcomes. The, the second study cited here was a multi-level study of about 280,000 respondents. They found that people are more likely to self-report fair or poor health in states where there's below average voter turnout. 
they concluded that socioeconomic inequality in political participation, as measured by voter turnout, is associated with poor self-rated health, independently of both income inequality and state median household income. Next slide, please. So this particular study examined the links between civic engagement, such as voting, volunteering, and activism during late adolescence and early adulthood, and socioeconomic status and mental and physical health in adulthood. Using nationally representative data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health, a propensity score matching approach was used uh, to regular, rigorously estimate how civic engagement is associated with outcomes among 9,471 adolescents and young adults. All forms of civic engagement are positively associated with subsequent income and education level. So voting among adolescents was associated with less risky health behaviors and fewer depressive symptoms in young adulthood. It was thought that from a theoretical standpoint, voting presents an opportunity to exert, or exert voice, perhaps establishing a path to health through empowerment. Next slide, please. Another study looked at activism. Two online surveys using a sample of college students and a national sample of activists matched with a control group demonstrated that several indicators of activism were positively associated with measures of social well being. Statistical analysis showed that after controlling for demographic factors like age, race, political orientation, and, and education, study participants who scored higher in political activism also reported higher levels of personal well-being. Furthermore, the study showed that activists were more likely to be flourishing than non-activists. Next slide, please. A multi-level analysis using data from the World Survey, World Value Survey, which was 44 countries and an N of about 50,000, showed that people who participated in voting and voluntary social activities tended to report better subjective health than those who did not vote or participate in social activities, even after controlling for sociodemographic factors at the individual level. So registered voters were shown to have higher levels of social connection. Next slide, please. Research, as we know, also shows a causal impact of social relationships on health. Prospective studies which control for baseline health status consistently show increased risk of death among persons with low quantity and sometimes low quality of social relationships. Experimental and quasi-experimental studies of humans and animals also suggest that social isolation is a major risk factor for morta mortality from, a widely vary from widely varying causes. I'm sorry, I just worked the night shift last night, so if I'm stumbling on my words, please forgive me. Um, one of the things about working uh, hospitalists, you can't predict your uh, schedule uh, months in advance, so I apologize. Um, so there are so many benefits of social connection, um, such as higher self-esteem and empathy, stronger gene expression for immunity, better emotional regulation and skills, lower rates of anxiety and depression, um, and voting allows us to feel connected socially. It allows us to feel that we are a part of something larger than ourselves and we have some control over the, the outcomes that impact us. Next slide, please. So the second point that we will discuss is that racial and social inequities persist and need non-optical solutions. The AMA followed up on their June 2020 acknowledgement of the health consequences of violence in police interactions and denounced racism as an urgent threat to public health. In November of 2020, the AMA recognized that racism negatively impacts and exacerbates health inequities among historically marginalized communities. Without systemic and structural level change, health inequities will continue to exist and the overall health of the nation will suffer. Next slide, please. So it's so important to be more than an optical ally, which is a surface level commitment. It is meant to make a statement, but not aimed at breaking away from oppressive systems of power. 
Next slide, please. Allyship requires action. One way that institutes can help, can and, and should engage in and advocate for their patients is to help patients vote. This would help address upstream social and racial inequities. Declaring racism a, a public health crisis is an important first step in recognizing the impacts of racism throughout the lifespan and across generations. Acknowledging the role of the government and other institutions in creating inequitable outcomes and committing to a path forward that centers on equity and justice. That path must include the protection and expansion of voting rights, which are fundamental to a healthy democracy and healthy communities. Next slide, please. So these issues have impacted us locally as well. As early as 1870, St. Petersburg County citizens voted against a state measure giving Blacks the right to vote. In 1913, the Democratic Party conducted a whites-only primary, and in the 1930s, a city charter had provisions for a white primary. In 1937, the KKK marched through Black communities to keep them from voting on a referendum. Out of more than 200 declarations of racism as a public health crisis across the United States, Three declarations specifically call out local history related to voting, a key step in organizing and rectifying historical injustices. And one of those was in St. Petersburg, Florida. So a little bit off the topic, but um, parallel to that, the city of St. Petersburg actually just commissioned a study team led by USF in partnership with several community members to examine both the historical and modern day impact that structural racism has had on the lives of Black people in the city of St. Petersburg. The examination and identification of factors of structural racism that specifically impact, impact Black residents and communities in St. Petersburg as they relate to education, the criminal legal system, and economic development within St. Petersburg was evaluated. And this was actually led um, by Dr. Ruth Maid Sears. She is was a principal investigator and she's a, an associate professor for math and associate director of the Coalition of Science Literacy with a focus on inclusive excellence um, from USF. So that study just came out. I heard them talking about it on NPR just this week. So um, it's available on the internet if anyone is interested in finding that. So how can we as healthcare providers address all of this that we've discussed? I know we've discussed a lot of indirect and direct uh, consequences and, and outcomes. Um, how can we as, as healthcare providers address this? So let me introduce you to Vote ER, an exciting initiative to bring voter registration into the healthcare space. Vote ER works to provide patients the opportunity to register to vote as the reality is that much of our healthcare system and healthcare experiences are determined by the policies our elected officials implement. This is also the organization that implemented and carried out the Civic Health Fellowship, which Dr. Caputo and, myself, and I uh, participated in this past year. Next slide, please. So over 300 hospitals, clinics, and health centers are helping patients vote as a part of Vote ER. These letters are from hospital CEOs encouraging voting. Next slide, please. Over 100 medical associations and organizations work with Vote ER to help their members and staff vote. Next slide, please. So point number three that we will discuss is that healthcare providers themselves need to vote. Next slide, please. So interestingly, from 1996 to 2002, physicians voted about 9% less than the general population. So since then, we should have fixed this, right? Next slide, please. More recent studies from 2006 to 2018 show that the problem has actually gotten worse, that physicians vote 14% less than the general population. So we owe it to our patients to be at the table when it comes to deciding our nation's health policies. This not only means by voting ourselves, but by encouraging our patients to vote as well. Next slide, please. So in the 2020 election, healthcare providers helped 
over 48,000 colleagues and patients get ready to vote. And this data was collected by Vote ER. So Vote ER has come up with a three-step plan at how to keep the pulse going on voting. Number one, the first step of number th of three, make sure you are registered to vote. So it takes about 60 seconds and there's this QR code or this website that you can scan to make sure that you are registered um, to, to check your voting status. Next slide, please. S the second step is get a kit to help others vote. So join thousands of other clinicians who use their free Healthy Democracy Kit to help patients, family, and friends vote. This kit includes a badge backer with a QR code and a lanyard, which I think Dr. Caputo is wearing hers, and she can show you. That's what it looks like. The QR code directs patients to register to vote or to vote by mail. So this is a great way um, when you're seeing a patient, you know, taking a social history, maybe just asking along with the normal questions that we usually ask about, you know, smoking, drinking and drugs, you know, are you registered to vote? And if they say no, we can ask them if they'd like to register and just have them scan the code and, you know, and, and give them that opportunity. Next slide, please. And the third step is help your clinical site. Uh, Vote ER provides posters, discharge paperwork, and materials that can help patients ensure that they are ready to vote. Um, these are designed to excite patients about registering to vote. Um, and uh, these resources are available in both English and Spanish. Next slide, please. And as a bonus, this is not a part of the three point pulse check. But if any of you are interested, uh, medical students, residents, social workers, um, nurses, any of our attendings that are listening to this, um, the Civic Health Fellowship, I can I can vouch for Dr. Caputo and I, I think um, really both what we learned a lot um, about not just community organizing, but about how to motivate people about the importance of taking these steps about um, systemic change and how what that looks like on creating a movement and what that looks like. Um, so a lot of, you know, themes that you would not relate to healthcare, but are so integral to kind of moving the needle on these these important topics of change. And, um, you know, it was for us, it was a 10 month fellowship. Um, three lectures a month. Uh, one was a lecture, then a practice, and then a reflection feedback session. Um, next year, I think that was the first year that they had done this. And we had actually colleagues from all over the United States, which I, which I think was one of the best parts of the fellowship, was really the networking that it provided. Um, colleagues uh, from that are all in different professions, as I would mentioned, any kind of a health professional. Um, but uh, I think the networking and hearing what is going on in other communities and what other hospitals are doing and what other medical schools are doing was really interesting and I think helpful. Um, so if any of you are interested, as I had mentioned, this was the first year, next year will be the second year. So they're actually changing the format a little bit to a six month, two sessions per week, um, civic health fellowship. It's all virtual via Zoom. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either one of us, but the application will be available at this website, um, available next week. So within uh, within one uh, seven days. Next slide, please. So I want to leave you with this final thought. We're all familiar with the way that DMVs are equipped to register patients to vote. So why can't we do the same in our hospitals and clinics? Voter registration belongs in the hospital just as much as in the DMV. And Americans often have a more regular interaction with their healthcare providers than DMVs. So bringing voter registration to our hospitals would be an important touch point. Vote ER's platform ensures that providers remain nonpartisan and confident when helping patients register to vote. Next slide, please. So in um, honor of a great 
man and a great legacy. Um, we just celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King Day on Monday. I wanted to leave you with this thought. So give us the ballot and we will no longer have to worry about worry the federal government about our basic rights. That's how strongly he believed in the power of voting and how much impact and influence he felt that it had. Next slide. And that concludes our presentation. We would love to hear any comments or feedback or questions. And I wanted to Hi, echo what Dr. Kapoor, of course, please, please jump in. Hi, this is Risa Richardson. Um, thank you so much for this important presentation uh, that helps us understand some mechanisms by addressing healthcare disparities. Um, I also just wanted to kind of highlight a tool that um, recently came out. My work is primarily in the rehabilitation setting and folks with brain injury. Um, so people with disability who are particularly disadvantaged in, in getting out and, and getting their voices heard. And so uh, recently, one of our knowledge translation centers developed a patient handout for how to help persons with disability vote and some factors of like to think about for planning ahead and getting access to voting. And so I'll drop that link to the fact sheet in the chat. It's available for free for download um, as a resource that can be given out in clinics or anything like that. So I'll add that to the chat. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, um, certainly um, individuals with disabilities are um, another one of the most marginalized communities when it comes to the current voting process. Um, and that's actually going to be um, a focus of next year's iteration of the fellowship because that was one of the things that some of our current fellows brought up um, specifically, including some of those resources in the training. So thank you for sharing that um, with us today. Ellie, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. It's very informative and very important. Um, I had a question when we approach patients, uh, you know, we live in a um, sort of a right or left uh, society. So um, is there a script or a way that is um, appropriate to sort of approach it in a very neutral way? This is very important for your health. Uh, for you to be registered to vote and not necessarily from a partisan standpoint. Right, so that's a very important point. Um, in order to do this work in a healthcare space, it has to come from a nonpartisan point of view um, in order you know, to meet all of the legal criteria. Um, but certainly everything seems to be, um, you know, kind of extreme in our current culture. So um, we do have some scripts. Um, and um, if you go on the votiar.org, they have um, included in their resource tab um, kind of the full um, scripts that you can look at. But it's to kind of summarize, it's keep it very simple. You know, just simply, are you registered to vote? And if they say no, are you interested in registering to vote? And then they can scan your QR code and it brings them to a very basic um, home page that says, you know, click here to check your registration status. You know, it's all nonpartisan. Um, and what I have found, because I've started using um, mine back in the 2020 election, sometimes people do um, kind of take offense. And for those people, I kind of just dropped it. You know, they would sort of see my, my vote lanyard and they would be like, oh, what, do you support Biden? And I would I would just drop it, you know, because you don't want to get into any sort of argument or trying to convince somebody about their politics. It's just a simple, are you registered? Just like if they showed up at the DMV and they were going through, you know, do you want to be an organ donor? Are you registered to vote? Um, just including that very simple language. But on um, votiar.org, they do have um, some more kind of elaborate scripts um, to help support you in that. And we will, um, 
be sharing some of those with with the department and with the residency. I think, you know, I think uh, part of the motive in doing this lecture was number one to inform all of us about how important voting is and the impact on health, because I think that was one thing that I, I see Dr. Mai's question about if we could speak to um, how what we learned in the fellowship is changing our behaviors and actions. So I think for me, firstly, was realizing, um, I think I knew theoretically about the impact of voting and civic engagement on health, but to actually see numbers and see, you know, over and over these patterns in communities, disenfranchised communities all over the country, to me, um, really resonated and to hear about experiences that our colleagues are having um, all over the, the country um, in, in certain parts about registration, about civic engagement, about getting people to turn out. I think that was really impactful for me. Um, but I think that one of our motives was to kind of get first of all, to build the knowledge base and to get the information out there and share that with all of you. And then I think secondly, our, our next step, we would love to, um, anybody that's interested, we would love to um, get you know, something up and going for the midterm election, that we have more of us wearing lanyards and more of us asking our patients in clinics and in the emergency rooms, um, you know, the simple question. And um, like Jen said, to keep it very neutral, I think part of the issue now, I think politics, as we know, it's it's become so divided, especially living living in Florida, you know, it's, it's a very divided state. Um, and so I think that, you know, normalizing asking this question and 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 just normalizing asking a question just as we would, you know, any other social history question. And and I think the more we ask it, the more, you know, people will get used to being asked this question and and it will become, you know, something more regular. So I think it's part of it is changing the culture, changing the culture of healthcare um, to include this as an important component. So I think that's one thing that I think one of the main things I'm taking away from the fellowship. Um, I think the second thing that I'm taking away, um, so uh, sorry, to finish up that thought was we will be following up with anybody that's interested in getting involved and sharing scripts and maybe doing like a, a teaching with the residents or the medical students. We would love to get more of you involved. Um, um, Vote ER actually has um, QR codes that can be specific for institutions. So we can have one set up for USF and actually track the numbers of how many people we've gotten to vote and things like that. So I think that would be really interesting for us to see um, from year to year how we're doing. Um, and hopefully this can be something that, you know, continues to, uh, to become a normal part of our healthcare conversations. The second thing that I'm taking away before I hand it over to Jen um, is um, I think one of the slides that really sticks in my head is the power of a movement. And and I feel like sometimes when you're doing this kind of work, it can feel like you're the only one and and you can feel so a little bit isolated or feel that other people don't care. And I think that that's not true. First of all, I think many people do care. It's just our processes and our, our workflows don't allow for these kind of interactions. And I think, you know, changing the culture and changing our workflow a little bit to include some things that could be of great benefit is really important. But one slide that sticks out to me is, you know, it showed a snowflake and then the snowflake then, you know, when you put many of them together, it becomes a snowball. And then the snowball, if you put many of them together, can become an avalanche. And that to me, I think really sticks out that, you know, it's important that we find like-minded people and get people, in, you know, involved that potentially could have a little bit of interest and, and, and that can create a movement. Jen, you, uh, what did you learn and how is it going to impact your, <laughs> your um, behaviors? I think, um, I think one of the most interesting things to see from other um, people across the country was that it really is a cultural shift, um, you know, to go from asking, does this even have a place in our healthcare institution? To, there is a community health center in Phoenix that actually um, got their health center registered as a polling station, and it became the most active polling station during the last election in that community. Um, and so, right, people come to us. Um, people are always going to need health care. 
Um, not everybody goes to the DMV. So, you know, we are kind of a community touchstone that can plug people in to this whole civic process when they might not otherwise ever be asked. Um, and that's one of the, the things that we learned was that the number one reason people give when you ask them, why aren't you registered to vote, is that nobody's ever approached them about registering. Um, and it's it's it seems um, kind of unbelievable if you come from a background like we have, where there's you know tabling at your college campus or you're at the DMV and and you know I've been approached to vote. I can't even count how many times. But there's whole swaths of our community that nobody ever asked them to be part of this process, and we can be that change factor and get these people in to the voting process. Um, was my big takeaway. And I think just to echo what you said, you know, the DMV, it's become a normal place now for people to register, right? Because we've shifted the culture um, that people know that they can go there to do that. So if we can shift the culture, I mean, people are are likely um, interacting with healthcare providers or their healthcare institutions on a more regular basis than the DMV, especially those that perhaps can't drive, don't have access to a car, have no need to, for going to the DMV, pay, are, are uh, residents with disabilities. So there's so many people that may not even, you know, have a need for the DMV, but they will be seeing their doctor. They will be going to their, you know, cl local clinic, their hospital. So I think the the possibilities are, are really, um, you know, there's so much possibility and so much opportunity, I think, um, in trying to shift this culture. I think I saw Shanu had her hand up. Hi, thank you both so much for this really excellent discussion on a really important topic. And I think COVID and vaccines, et cetera, have really brought out how um, intertwined politics are in healthcare and health policy. Um, and I think this ability to help our folks um, even be registered for voting is a great way, an easy way for us, easy entry way for us to be advocates um, on both ends. I'm curious if you have recommendations for other ways for us as healthcare providers to be advocates for health policy, specific topics in health that we may be involved in um, within our department. You know, we have so many different specialties um, and needs of patients in a variety of different ways that are not currently represented well. So I think um, one way, like we talked about during our presentation, is for all of us to be voting. Um, because, right, we obviously know a lot about health and health policy, and that's always a big part of platforms when it comes election time. And as, you know, we showed, we historically do not show up at the polls. So making sure that we have voting plan, um, right? A lot of us are on shift, on service come election day. So you have to think about, are you going to vote early? Are you going to vote by mail? How are you going to make sure that you vote in elections. Um, and I think the second thing that we can do is, you know, working with our, um, our organizations like ACP, SHM, um, and their advocacy branches that have um, days to meet with state legislatures and even um, in DC, because representatives care about what we have to say. Just the fact that we have that MD after our name, if you meet with a local representative and tell them what you think about what's going on with public health policy with COVID or any number of health issues, whatever it is that gets you fired up, they care about what you have to say about it because you have that automatic expertise walking in and that matters to them you know you have that credibility so um doing those you know um you know white coat on the hill days um it, it seems like one small action because it's one day for the year but we have legitimacy from the place of privilege we come from um to be able to elevate um, public health issues to the people who are in positions to enact policy to change things. 
Absolutely. And I want to kind of branch off of that and say, not just with our professional societies, but if there is, you know, um, a community organization or anyone else in the community, if you are um, a member of one of the local political parties, being a physician does carry weight in the community. And, and you know, coming from a place of expertise and many of us that have been working with COVID in the last couple years, you know, um, we speak from a place of authority and privilege. So I think that expertise is does carry weight in any of these settings. So you know, if you go to a community organization and you say, I'm a doctor and I think you should vote because it it's going to help your health, you know, just even, you know, saying something like that, it will make people um, sit up and take notice. I don't see any other hands. Um, so just once again, I just want to thank you all for your time. Um, if you do have any questions or you're interested in getting involved with this work, please reach out to Manal or I um, and um, look for some communications to come um, about how to get involved and, and how to um, kind of join our Vote ER effort here at USF. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for thank coming so today. Much. Yes. I just wanted to say one more thing. Sorry. Just thank you to Dr. Sennett and Dr. Oxner for allowing us to um, pursue this fellowship or giving us the opportunity. Um, so anyone else that's interested, please reach out to us for more information. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all. Bye.